Hello and welcome to another episode of the e-commerce coffee break podcast. Today we want to find out about website errors, how it impacts your business and what you can do to prevent any kind of errors on your website. Joining me on the show today is Kelly Noevo. He's the co-founder of Noevo.com, a leading error monitoring platform for surfacing, prioritizing and solving website error. So let's dive right in, into it and let's welcome Kaylin to the show. Hi, how are you today? Great. Thanks so much for having me on. Really appreciate it. Yeah, great to have you here. I think we have never spoken about the possibilities of having a website that does not perform 100% where errors are coming up. And I have heard something that about 90% of website errors are never reported by customers, by website visitors. Is that true? What's your experience with that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. I think um, obviously it depends on the type of product that you sell, but often the more accessible the product is online, um, the more the less likely someone is to report an issue. Uh, issues could be things as uh, small as images not loading that causes someone to bounce to one of the payment gateways just not working. Um, candidly, it's something that typically uh, will cost you three to five percent of your annual GMV. Um, in terms of broken links, images not loading, and some of the gateway issues that I that I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. I think everyone comes to a website basically daily where something is not working. Now, with e-commerce, that's a crucial thing. Um, if something is not working, the trust factor just vanishes. Um, you will not buy from a website that is broken and trust them with your credit card. Now, a lot of businesses out there, they are more reactive than proactive when it comes to fixing errors. Um, so panic comes up and I've spoken to many, many e-commerce entrepreneurs and everyone has a story to share that when something broke and what kind of impact that you had. And you just said it has a relatively high impact on your revenue. Now, let's dive into what actually is the worst case scenario. How can I deal with that? Yeah, I think the most common story uh, for most e-commerce businesses is they don't hear about errors every single day in most cases, but when they do, it's often a customer that will say, oh, I had trouble checking out or it's an executive that actually finds an issue and then everyone scrambles to try and reproduce the issue. And then it's, oh, it works on my computer. How come it doesn't work on yours? And it's really kind of really challenging to coordinate what the actual issue is and understand the impact. Uh, so often what will happen is there's these like micro, what I like to call micro downages. And what I mean by that is, oh, this region of the U.S. on Firefox iPhone, these seven products don't work when you try and add them to cart. PayPal doesn't work in another region uh, when your internet speed is less than, I don't know, a certain threshold. So it's all these like edge case uh, impacts that when you aggregate them up, like I'd mentioned, can cost you up to three to 5% of your total GMV, which is often pretty significant for brands. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a bigger brand, you probably maintain your own platform. You have headless commerce, um, you have a team, a development team, and they obviously should be focused on developing your website, not focusing on finding bugs in your system. Um, I understand you have a lot of experience with that. Well, what's your approach to to help them? Yeah, I, I think when when we look at bugs, I've never met a software engineer or a manager or product manager that wants to allocate 30 to 50 percent of their bandwidth to bugs and stability, right? They want to build features, they want to drive KPIs, but often it's a necessary evil to really stabilize the website. And what we've realized is uh, through this kind of journey of almost the last decade is a lot of that maintenance was actually being scoped manually. So a good example is you have a QA that will QA the website. They'll find 15 different defects, right? Then someone will manually try and scope a business case, like try and estimate based on the uh, traffic percentage of the browser device combination, what the ROI of solving this bug is, and then stack rank that against uh, building a new feature. So it's always trying to balance uh, like speed and agility of shipping to quality. And really what we're on a mission to do is automate quality. And, and what I mean by that is it's how do we build a system that will take you from 30, 35% of your engineering hours spent on, on dev work to under 5%. I think a really famous case uh, that we worked with, it is uh, Carrefour, which is one of the top 10 retailers in the world based on revenue. Um, when we started working with them back in 2020, 
a lot of their time was going on stability. And and what I mean by automating stability is starting off with ensuring that there's no false positive JIRA tickets that are being opened up from customer service. So how does customer service investigate complaints? Oh, okay, cool. Eight out of ten are uh, eight out of ten are false positives, and then the other two are actually the same issue. So you don't have to open up multiple different tickets. You open up one ticket, and making sure that less tickets get open. But then when the tickets do get open, how do we ensure that the quality of the ticket is uh, is as high as possible, so that the business slash support team is speaking the same language as the technical team? And no one has ever built a product that has enabled business product slash customer service to interact with technical people in a language that makes sense to both that's centered around the KPIs for the business. So as you start implementing these systems, you see less tickets get open, they, they get solved quicker, and there's a lot more automation around your releases and things like that. So all in all, your time spent on bugs will actually dramatically decrease and the quality of your website will also increase, which is going to drive business for the uh, revenue for the business, which means everybody's happy. Engineering spending less time on bugs, but also the business and growth team are ensuring that bugs aren't slowing down the return on ads or they're just general sales. Mm -hmm. A very important thing that you mentioned there, and I had this in the past, is there's just different languages involved. A developer speaks and understands a different language than, as I said, somebody who's in marketing. And sometimes they just cannot communicate with each other. It, it just doesn't work. <laughs> so you need some a middleman or a system in the middle that helps with that. Now, a bigger systems, obviously, you said there's a lot of APIs in there. There's payment gateways there. There's email gateways there and so on and so forth. How is it possible or what's the best perfect way to, to monitor all of these different systems to really find where the bug is? It's a, it's, a, it's a great point. And I think um, in the absence of an automated system, often the engineering teams are a bit siloed out of the business, unless you work for like an Amazon or a Walmart. Most people use systems integrators. Like I think like 70, 75% of our base interacts with the systems integrator uh, because ultimately they build clothing, they build retail items. They're not, they're not, they don't consider themselves a technology business. And um, being able to actually understand the root cause is really important. So a great example is Apple Pay doesn't work, right? Okay, cool. Is it a native Apple issue? Is it a server issue? Is it a JavaScript issue that is blocking you because of the browser device combination that you're using, right? Is it a, oh, your, your uh, shipping options aren't properly loading into like what is the actual root cause so that you can triangulate who you need to open up the ticket with is it an internal issue is it an si is it a third party issue in which you need to communicate directly with the third party so being able to instrument the root cause in once again a way that is it, that is understandable for both technical and non-technical people is often one of the biggest gaps that we fill even if someone is using an error monitoring a traditional error monitoring system that's built for uh, highly technical people to triage through hundreds of, of different error codes. Um, being able to actually enable both teams to collaborate on the same platform is where we found that we're driving a ton of value because it's often product and business folks that own bug creation at large retailers um, because they're interacting often with the systems integrator or a removed team. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So Noibu, obviously you monitor e-commerce sites and you flag arrows in real time. How does that work? Give me a bit of an idea. Is there AI involved? How do we pro process all the data that is coming in? Yeah, so the way that our strategy is looking at this is if we can get percentage of engineering time spent on bugs to zero while the quality of the website is at the highest point it's ever been, that's the ultimate goal. So through that, you need to streamline and drive automation. No one's going to invest in a tool that's going to make their engineering team spend more time on bugs. It's the opposite. You want to get more done with way less time. So to answer your question, how it works is we aggregate all the different issues and we have, uh, because we're vertically integrated, we have access to data that's not publicly available through, uh, through the system, uh, through the uh, the platforms that we work with, and some of the third parties, and we really try and capture a hundred percent of the issues on your website, 
And then we actually, a, we, we basically look at that and we say, hey, when these, out of the 20,000 issues that we caught, when these 12 issues occur, conversion drops by 20, 30, 40% to that cohort of users. So we really streamline the prioritization. And then from that point, we provide a richness of information that's not only understandable to the business person, but more impactful, helps the, uh, helps the technical person solve the bug much quicker. So we show them exactly where the issue is, the where the code's breaking, explain to them how to fix it. And we even have recommended coding solutions for the engineering team to actually leverage to fix the bugs. Mm -hmm. Now, the first point of contact for uh, reporting a bug might not necessarily be the de developer or the engineering team. That might be customer support, that might be marketing, anyone else in the organization. Um, what, what's your recommendation to deal with this kind of reporting structure? It's a great point. So to your point, often it's not going to get opened up directly with engineering. So it actually usually goes through two to three sets of hands. So it goes from the customer to the customer support agent. The customer support agent will try and help them debug at that, uh, at that stage to avoid opening up a ticket. That's the first place where we drive value. We empower through our system the ability for the customer support agent to understand what's happening to the customer so that they can open, they can actually help the customer complete the transaction without opening up a ticket. That's the first place. The second place is that often gets sent to a business analyst or a product manager or somebody who's like a middleman, middlewoman on the business side. They try and replicate what the customer saw and scope the size and scale of the bug so that they can coordinate with the engineering team. We automate that as well. We have the exact line of code that's broken. We show you exactly where the error is. We quantify the error automatically in terms of a GMB impact. And we then enable you to sync that issue directly with JIRA so that when the engineering team gets that ticket, it's in a way that is understandable to them, that they can then move and fix it as quickly as possible. And then I mentioned the last part, which is the third stakeholder, is the engineering people. They don't want a ticket that sounds like, oh, Sally couldn't check out last Thursday on iPhone. Like that doesn't help them. And that's most of the tickets that will come in or someone will try and replicate it. And it's just, it's, it's very low fidelity info. So once that ticket gets to them, we want them to be able to solve it. Now that's the workflow that we call the reactive workflow that we really help enable and make way more efficient. What we want to get the org to is a place where they've been proactive, meaning they're pro the engineering team is collaborating with the product team to pro do one to two cycles of tech debt so that they actually solve all the outstanding issues. And then from that point on, as they do releases, the, our system is notifying them of new impactful issues that are coming up so that it never gets the, to the point where it gets to customer service. So customer service will get less calls and less um, things will be actually passed down the line. So that's the that's how we will eventually get you to under 5% investment of your time towards um, towards uh, support and maintenance. Mm -hmm. No, makes perfect sense. Tell me a little bit about the implementation. It sounds very complicated because there's so many moving parts in there. Um, what, what are the process steps to get up and running? Yeah, so what we like to do with everyone who's interested is we like to run a, a complimentary kind of trial audit. So the initial deployment's quite easy. It's just through Google Tag Manager. So it takes less than five minutes to uh, deploy. It's an asynchronous script. We don't collect or store any private data. We're fully GDPR compliant for the European users. So that's the initial deployment. And then often when people sign on, um, there's maybe a one to two hour commit on both sides to set up our SDK, the backend integrations and all the other stuff, but it's all pretty, uh, pretty seamless, uh, to be honest. It's just quick integrations. Mm -hmm. Who's your perfect customer? Are there specific industries or niches or verticals that you work more with than others? Yeah. So we're platform and vertical agnostic. What we really like to do and we're a big sweet spot for us is anybody who likes to treat their website like a product and actually iterate and add features and they see it as a competitive advantage that is a perfect fit for us and then typically higher margin higher aov customers 
also are important to us um, because the cost of a transaction is pretty high. Like if you're selling a uh, Cartier bracelet, right? Losing one transaction is way more impactful than if you're selling uh, socks online, right? No disrespect to socks, but like you lose one to two transactions, not the end of the world. You're more of a volume play. But once again, we serve both verticals, but typically the higher the AOV, the higher the traffic, the higher the complexity, that's typically where we drive uh, the most value. Mm -hmm. Did you share a success story of one or case study of one of your customers um, from implementing to going live? What kind of results did they see? Yeah, that's, that's great. I, I, I'll, I have two that come to mind. Um, so one is car four, which I mentioned, which we have a case study with on our website. Uh, not only were we able to drive conversion, but we're able to drive a ton of internal efficiency where they've actually streamlined the way that they intake customer errors. They've gotten to a state where they're proactive with the release monitoring, and they're ensuring that they're always staying ahead on quality so that they can spend more time on features, um, on the pure GMV and sales side. Um, we, when, uh, when guests moved over to, uh, a new platform during COVID, um, and guests has been a customer for multiple years, they, um, they effectively deploy They were having a lot of stability issues, uh, in terms of just like there was bugs because as you launch a new website or you go headless, you replatform, there's going to always be issues. Uh, we're able to, uh, work with them to actually, uh, not only clean up the backlog, but also get ahead on tech debt and they saw a 15% increase in their checkout conversion. Um, and one of the main uh, reasons for that was just, they made it seamless. They had a lot, like any other retailer, by the way, uh, an old version of Safari on this uh, iPhone, this iPad doesn't work 100% of the time. Like there's all these micro outages that no one ever thinks about, even if you have QA and it's just not gonna get reported. Why? It's sorry, it's gonna get occasionally reported And then what will happen is someone will replicate it on their device. And unless it just so happens, they have the same combination of product, device, timing, all of that, which is almost never the case. It's going to work for them in which they're then just going to say, oh, it must have been an intermittent issue. And they're going to just write it off as a user issue or an intermittent issue. When in reality, there's actually a micro downage, especially if you're multi-country, um, multi-currency, all these things really start to come into play. Mm -hmm. I think very important that you mentioned there, you should focus or prioritize the ones, the bugs that basically have the biggest impact on your business and then work from there. And then the one that really occasionally comes up or on a, a very old device, um, you need to decide if you want to invest the work in solving it or just moving to more important things. Now you have your finger on, on the parts of e-commerce. What kind of emerging trends do you see right now in the online re retail landscape? Yeah, I think a, a trend that I've been seeing is um, as COVID started to happen, brands that didn't really care that much about e-com candidly, like I was selling into e-com before COVID and it was often not the biggest, most funded department. Um, there was running jokes where it was, uh, it was kind of the, uh, they have the, it's the smallest store from a percentage of sales, but they have the largest budget. And I think the narrative is largely flipped where it's now the largest store with the largest budget for most brands. And I think what I saw was a big rush towards getting websites stood up as quickly as possible or modernized as quickly as possible. So a lot of templates were being used and a lot of common frameworks were being used to launch websites. And now that um, overall the macro softened a little bit, um, people are investing more into customization, more into headless, more into composable so that they can differentiate their online assets. Like when you take a look at it, you go into a, I mentioned Cartier, who's a Noibu customer or a Montblanc or a Chloe and these high-end brands. Um, you go into their store and it does not look the same as someone who just launched um a SMB boutique in a strip mall, right? Like it doesn't look the same. So having your online properties virtually look the same and being built from the same templates is often, I think, something that people are now rethinking of. So I'm seeing a trend where things are moving more towards uh, composable, towards headless, towards heavy customization. 
as people are looking to now increase their conversion rate as the big flush to e-com. I don't think it mattered when everyone was forced to buy online, but now that people are forcing to, uh, or, or sorry, there's more competition and they're not forced to buy online, I'm seeing differentiation through experience, through customization, um, being really, really, really important to a lot of key brands. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting um, thing that you mentioned there. I think it also has a lot to do with branding, especially the top level brands um, want to basically separate themselves from a theme, from a template that you just can buy for $400 somewhere. So that makes perfect sense. Um, I want to yeah. touch quickly on the AI perspective on what's happening right now. What's your take on what's happening in e-commerce and AI? Yeah, I had a post on this the other day, and by no means am I an, e uh, am I an AI expert, but I do think that um, what AI has really done in the last year has uh, done two things. A, it's it's empowered smaller brands to actually embrace it. I think I AI is something that Walmart and Amazon, all those different brands were using in the past. And I think like the more mid-market junior enterprise, small enterprise teams with smaller budgets can now actually leverage it. I think uh, one of the trends I've seen is really how do I compile uh, historical data to uh, forecast demand, for example? Um, how do I use it to augment my customer service experience? Uh, I think there's a lot of tactical use cases that we're not seeing that we're seeing versus like the last trend, which was like Web three and crypto and all that stuff, where I think the application's a bit more nebulous. I think the application is pretty straightforward. You could either increase sales by further optimization. You could decrease costs by reducing uh, I don't know, support hours or things like that. And I think you can start to automate a lot of tedious tasks. Um, like maybe if you have multi-store, you need to translate, you can get a really good baseline through that. So those are some of the tactical things that I, I, I see um, being brought through with, with AI. And I think it's going to be an important part of the strategy. I think it is a platform shift kind of similar to mobile. Yeah, hundred percent agree. I think you can't do with AI and if you, um, just try to not put it into your business, then you will lose out very, very quickly before our coffee break comes to an end today. Is there anything that you want to share with our listeners that we haven't covered yet? Yeah, I, I, uh, um, I think one thing that we know to be true in commerce since the beginning of commerce, whether it's offline or online, is expectations increase over time. Um, and one of my earliest mentors once told me, and, and this is more applicable to the higher end non-commodity purchases, like if you're not buying toilet paper, if you're buying t-shirts or shoes or, or something that's personal, is... Um, the purchase is an exchange of emotion and there's a lot of uh verbal and visual cues that go into purchases and i think brands will need to heavily differentiate with on their entire journeys and that's why i think having a seamless fast customized um experience is something that's just never going to go out of style um for most of the uh for people that are effectively selling non-commodity goods. If you're selling commodity goods, it's speed and cost um, and efficiency. I think if you are looking to actually protect your margins and have a higher margin business, you need to invest in brand and you need to invest in experience because that's what's going to justify. Like people go to Tiffany's to buy an engagement ring not because they can't get the same sized ring with the same clarity at Costco for 50% of the price. They do it for the brand. They do it for the experience. They do it for the trust. And I think if both of those websites had the same website, then the good er, becomes worth the same. And I think both of those businesses are amazing, but that would be my thoughts. Yeah, I think, the key word there is trust. And when it comes to trust, as I said in the beginning, is like you want to have a seamless experience, as you mentioned, and you want to have a website that performs and that builds up this trust and doesn't have any kind of hiccups that might question you if you really want to spend your money there. And then and again, it has to do a lot with branding. Where can people find out more about you guys? 
Yeah, I mean, they can reach out to me directly on LinkedIn, just Kayla Noivo, or go to, go check out Noibu, or go to our website, noibu.com. Um, yeah, those are probably some of the, the best places I would look. Okay, I will put the links in the show notes, then you just want to click away. Kelly, thanks so much for, for your time today. I think it was a very good insight of what you can do to make your website waterproof and bulletproof and just perform and what kind of tools you and services you offer to make that work. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you for yours. Hey, Klaus here. Thank you for tuning in to another episode. Before we wrap things up, I've got a couple of important points to share. Firstly, if you have enjoyed today's episode and want to support the show, here's a simple way to do it. Help me out with that algorithm magic by liking, commenting, and subscribing on your favorite podcast app. And if you're feeling extra generous, leaving a rating would be great. Your support helps me bringing more impactful guests on the show, and it makes it easier for others to discover the podcast. Secondly, I want to talk about to all your business owners out there. Here's a question. Are you tired of juggling everything in your business while struggling with your marketing tasks? Fed up with hit and miss experiences of hiring freelancers or agencies that don't quite get your vision? But perhaps you're not ready to commit to a full-time in-house marketer just yet. Well, I've got a solution for you. Introducing our fractional marketing team. My team and I provide top-notch experienced marketing professionals to become an extension of your business. Not only will they save you up to 50% on cost compared to traditional hires, but they also take care of all this time-consuming, repetitive and complex marketing tasks that have been holding you back. And this way, you can concentrate on what truly matters, the core of your business. To learn more about how we can help you to scale up your online sales with a fractional team member, head over to our website, smart-ecommerce-marketing.com, or reach out to me directly and I'll get you the details. You will find the links in the show notes. Thanks for being a part of our podcast community and remember your support means the world to me. Until next time, see you then.